Although today's AI models are clearly powerful, it's not always obvious how businesses can use them to generate value. Last month, I hosted a workshop where I shared how I used AI to create customer segments for my business. The two key benefits of this approach are one, it can process unstructured data such as open-ended survey responses, and two, it can easily scale to hundreds of thousands of customer records. In case you missed it, here's the recording. I'm going to be talking about a quick project that is easy and instructive, but also I used this this exact code for like a practical real world business problem for myself. So excited to share it and hopefully it gives you guys some ideas on some beginner friendly projects that you can start working on that also provide some kind of real world impact. If you don't know me, I'm Shah. Here's a little quick about me before we get into the talk. I got to AI about six years ago while I was getting my PhD. At that time, I was a researcher working a lot with machine learning and AI for scientific discovery. After that, I graduated and went and worked at Toyota as a data scientist. After a while in that role, I went out on my own. So I quit my job to become an entrepreneur. And so that consisted of doing some independent consulting. So I helped over 100 clients in my first year doing a lot of content creation, but also doing some other offers. So started a course on Maven. Also, I launched this app called Y2B, which converts YouTube videos into blog posts, which is something that I personally use in my own content creation. Let's just dive right into it. The business problem is that analyzing survey data to improve, in this case, I'm talking about a course course, but it could be any kind of product or service to improve the marketing and the product itself. That's the problem we're trying to solve. Typically, numerical responses are pretty easy to analyze. So for my course, I have a pre-course survey and I have these two questions which have numerical responses, which are pretty easy to analyze. So we can see how much experience people have with the AI and ML and how much programming experience they have. And it's pretty easy to visualize it and do some kind of analysis. But these numerical metrics don't tell us the whole story, especially they don't tell us why they enrolled in the course, or if it's some other kind of product, they don't tell you why someone bought your product or why someone bought your service. Numbers can only tell you so much. So this is where open-ended responses are super helpful. The one I had for my pre-course survey was what is your dream outcome for the course? And then this is where you really get the real meat of why your customers bought your product or your service. The open-ended responses give you better insights, but of course the downside here is that it's tedious to like read through all this and it can be difficult to analyze and read the tea leaves. So the first thought might be something like ChatGPT. So this is like a great initial solution, but it may not be ideal for the long run. So let's just talk about the pros and cons here. The pros is that ChatGPT is fast and easy to use. You can take a CSV file, upload it to ChatGPT, say something like, hey, can you please split this into different customer segments and generate personas for each segment or something like that. And another upside of ChatGPT is that it can work with both the numerical and the text data. The text data, it can understand directly. You can also understand the numerical data, but it'll probably write some Python code or something to analyze the numbers that you provide in any kind of CSV file. But of course, there's some downsides to using ChatGPT. So one is that this might break down if it's a complex task. So if you have a lot of different variables that you're looking at, or it's going to require some kind of like multi-step reasoning to generate a good breakdown of these customer segments. I guess now they have this more agentic stuff with ChatGPT, but still it can kind of go off the rails if you don't give it a lot of good guidance and instruction. But regardless of how well ChatGPT can reason, the ultimate problem is that this won't scale past a few hundred samples because the context length of any large language model is limited. So you can't fit 500 or 1000 or 10,000 survey responses in their context window. You can't just upload this to ChatGPT or Claude. That's kind of what we're talking about with scalability, which brings us to solution number two. And so there are these things called text embeddings, which are basically meaningful numerical representations of text. The basic idea just visualized here is let's say we have these survey responses. So we have people's responses to the question, what's your dream outcome for this course or this product or whatever it is. And we have these open-ended responses. Text embeddings will take these text responses and translate them into a numerical representation, which we could visualize on a plot like this. And what's valuable about this is that now that we have translated 
translated these responses into numbers, we have a wide range of statistical tools and analytical tools that we can apply to that to do some kind of analysis. So let's say we want to do a clustering analysis to generate segments based on these responses. Now we've got these clusters appearing here. And then if we were to look at this red cluster here, we see that these responses are saying things like, I want to land a program manager job working with AI product or AI program. This other person is saying they want to land a new job. So it's like, okay, so these are like the job seekers here. Then we look at this green cluster and it's people trying to build stuff. So build GPT to access functions and APIs, hands-on fine tuning with Laura. This one's saying, I love to apply AI solution to existing and future backend projects. So these are more like the builders, the developers. And then we have this blue cluster, which is somewhere in the middle and it's people trying to build products or let's see, train and build a model to have some practical usage or put AI into practice for real business solutions. So these people aren't just interested in building stuff for fun, but they're interested in building stuff to make an impact. So now we're starting to see patterns in this unstructured data of these free flowing text responses. So that kind of brings us to the solution I'm going to talk about in this talk, which is using these embeddings to do customer segmentation. And this is actually a really simple four step process. So first we'll just import our survey data using Python and we'll use a library called pandas to do that. We'll use OpenAI's API to compute embeddings. So to do this translation from text into numbers, then we'll use scikit-learn to cluster the responses. And then finally, we can visualize the results and see the clusters. The code for this example is freely available on this GitHub repo. I'll copy this and I'll drop it in the chat in case people wanted to download it or follow along. And we can just look at it together here. So if we go to this lightning lesson folder, we'll see the example notebook, we'll see the requirements, and then there's some instructions on how to get this running on your machine. So here's the notebook, and I'm just using Jupyter Lab to run this. And if you follow these instructions here on the GitHub repo, it'll load something like this in your browser. The first step in writing any kind of Python code is to import some handy libraries. Here are the libraries we're gonna use here. So Pandas is gonna allow us to import the data and do some data manipulation. Matplotlib is just a standard library for data visualization. We're using sklearn to do dimensionality reduction. So this goes to your question, Andre, because these text embeddings represent text via very high dimensional vectors. But the problem is we can't really visualize a thousand dimensions on a computer screen or in any way. So we can use this approach called PCA to translate those 1000 dimensions into just two so it'll fit on our monitor. And then finally, we're going to use k-means to do the clustering. And then NumPy is just a standard library for doing some math. But then this is a key one. So for generating the embeddings, we're going to use OpenAI's API. This is how you import their library. You're going to need a OpenAI secret key to do this. Their API is paid. So unlike ChatGPT, which you can access for free to use their API, you need an API key and it has some cost associated with it. But generating embeddings is actually very, very cheap. I don't think I spent more than a cent on this example. And then we're just going to set up the connection with OpenAI's API using this line of code here. So now that we've got all our libraries imported, we're just going to loan in our data. So we can take a look at that real quick. So if we go to this data folder and click survey.csv, so you have this CSV file of job titles and then join reasons. And it seems like there are some patterns just by skimming it. It's like, okay, we see founder, 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 staff scientist, data scientist, data scientist, VP, CTO, CEO, CTO. So just skimming it, we see these patterns. But of course, maybe it's not a big deal for, oh, I guess, you know, 83 is a lot. So maybe you don't want to read through 83 job titles and join reasons, but you could do it if you were motivated. Let's say if this was 800 samples, there's no way you're going to go through and read all these and be able to do some kind of meaningful analysis with it. We can take this CSV file and import it into Python using this line of code. And then it's just going to create this data frame object. This is what the data frame looks like. So we've got the job titles here and then we have the join reasons. But one thing that we'll run into is that we see that originally the data frame has 83 rows and two columns. But the issue is there are some missing values. Like for example, there's no job title or join reason for that person. This person doesn't have a join reason and these three people don't have join reasons. So we have missing data and there isn't like an obvious way to fill in that data that won't skew the analysis. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and drop all the missing values with the assumption that basically these values are missing for some random reason. It looks 
the same after we dropped the missing values, but we can see that it went from 83 rows down to 66 rows. So we lost a, a fair amount of data. So again, even though this is like a small data set here, this code will work just as well if we scaled it up by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100. That's the upside of using Python for a problem like this, because it's just going to scale automatically. You just got to change this input CSV file. The next step we're going to do is to compute the embeddings. Using OpenAI's API, you can actually control the embedding dimension. So out of the box, I think it has 3000 dimensions that you can use. So here we're going to just use uh, 12 dimensions for the job titles. And then we're going to use 24 dimensions for the join reasons. Basically what's happening here is we're going to embed all of these job titles and all of these join reasons separately. So to do that is pretty straightforward. We just make this API call. We're going to pass in all the job titles from our data frame. We're going to specify the embedding model we want to use. So there are two options. There's a big model and there's a small model. So we're using the small one. And then we're going to set the embedding dimension. So here I'm just going to use a 12 dimensional vector. So you can imagine we put in a job title and then we get 12 numbers out for each job title. And then we'll do a similar thing for the join reason. What the only difference is instead of using 12 dimensions, we're going to use 24 dimensions, which is what's defined up here. Then we're going to do what we're going to do is create a list with all the embeddings. There's like a lot going on here. So let me just explain it. So we're creating this embedding list. And then what we're doing is we're taking this job embedding response. Let me just print it out. I think that's going to be easier. Job response is what the API spits back out to us. And then we can access this data attribute of that class. So if we do that, we see we have this embedding object and it has these 12 numbers. And then what we can do is extract the embeddings from this object. And so it's going to organize everything into a nice list. We can do a similar thing for the response reason. So basically you can just add lists together like this in Python. So now we have 36 numbers, which are the 12 numbers of the job response, the 24 numbers of the response reason. And then we're combining all that into a list. And then we're going to do that for every single row in our data frame. So this embedding list at the end of it should be a list of lists. So it'll be 66 lists corresponding to each row in our data frame. And then each list will have 36 elements. Okay, so all I'm doing here is translating this from a list into a data frame. So we can actually see what that looks like. So now everything's just organized into a data frame. We have the job embeddings as the first 12 columns, and then the final 24 columns are corresponding to the join reason. Just taking a step back, what we've done here is we've taken this representation of the survey responses, which was just two columns of text, and we've translated it into 36 columns of numbers. And so now we can do the clustering. Here, I'm going to just do five segments, and we can play around with different segment options just to see what it looks like. And then with one line of code, we can do the clustering process using k-means. So we have the segments. This is another option for clustering. It's called dbscan. It's a bit more sophisticated. So you can look into that if you're curious, but I'm just going to stick with k-means here. And then we can do PCA to do that dimensionality reduction. So again, we've got 36 numbers here. So we're talking about like a 36 dimensional vector if we're trying to visualize it, which we can't. So let's reduce it to 2D. We can do that with one line of code using PCA. And then basically, I'm just going to go through each of our segments. So we have five segments here, and I'm going to plot a scatter plot for each segment using a different color. This is what the result looks like. So it's a lot more messy than that toy example I showed on the slides. But we see that there's some patterns here. So we have like segment one tends to be over here. Segment two tends to be over here. Segment three is over here. Segment four and segment five. Okay, we did the clustering. We made a pretty plot. But what does that actually tell us? Like what is segment one? What is segment two? How do we interpret this? Going one step further, what we can do is we can take these clustering results and basically go back to our original data frame, look at all the rows for each cluster. So for example, we're going to look at segment number one. We're going to return all the rows of our original data frame that correspond to segment one. And then we're going to extract the job title and join reason. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that data and pass it to GPT-40 Mini. I'm using this prompt template to do that. So basically just having it adopt a persona like UI business strategist specializing in customer segmentation and on and on and on. So basically, I'm telling it to take these survey responses and generate a job title, desired outcome and key challenge for each segment. And then there's some additional instructions here. I wrote this function called generate avatar, which will take in 
in our secret key. It'll take in a data frame of all the text responses of a particular segment. It's going to translate it into a markdown table. So it's going to take this data frame and make it a text representation so we can give it to GPT-40. We're going to pass this table into our prompt template, which is what this thing is here. And then finally, we'll just make the API call. So now instead of using that embeddings endpoint, now we're using the chat completions endpoint. So we're going to call GPT-40 mini, and then we'll just pass it a single message, and then we're going to extract the response. The result of all that is for each segment, we have a clear interpretable description. So segment one corresponds to founders. Their desired outcomes are to gain practical skills to develop and fine tune AI applications, particularly in LLM and related technologies, key challenges, limited time to fully engage with code examples and implement projects in various cloud environments, We've got solutions architect, gain practical skills and knowledge in AI to effectively implement and manage AI projects in their respective fields, need to bridge the gap between theoretical understanding of AI and practical application in real world settings. Then we got product managers, founders again, data scientists, and so on. Now we're starting to get a better idea of what these segments actually mean and the different types of customers that are enrolling in this bootcamp. And then we can even go one step further and look at specific segments. So segment two sounded a little broad and I don't remember seeing that many solutions architects in the CSV file. So we can kind of double click into that and we can see all the different survey responses in segment two and some Similarly, we can do that for you know segment one. So founders, teacher, and a CEO. Let's see, segment five are data scientists. Yeah, so data scientist, ML engineer, data scientist, head of data solutions, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's basically it. I guess I went a little crazy on time. So I will do Q&A and I will stay 15 minutes after if you guys have questions, but I'll just call out the AI Builders Bootcamp, a cohort starting on February 6th, Thursday sessions, same time as this lightning lesson over Zoom, six sessions over six weeks, Weeks, and it's about 12 hours total of content. As we saw in the example, these are the people that seem to be getting the most value from it. So technical professionals, business leaders, and product managers and entrepreneurs. And I'll just call out that the course is $700, but as a special promo for being part of the lightning lesson, doing a 25% discount. So $175 off. You can just use this code lightning25 to get that. So with that, we can jump to Q&A. I know we're out of time, but happy to answer questions if you guys got them. John asks, is this method specific to cluster analysis of qualitative data versus quantitative data? No. So you can actually use both qualitative and quantitative data in this analysis. So that's like the upside of using text embeddings is that you can take qualitative data, translate it into numbers, into quantities, and then just do all your analysis. What if we are business architects and don't know Python? Will this course help? So that's a good question. 50% of the course is Python examples, building, writing code, things like that. Surprisingly, a segment of people, and we can actually see it here, there are a segment of people who are not technical at all. So less than one year of experience in programming, but they still seem to get value out of the course. And specifically what I do after each lecture is I'll stay on 30 minutes after, and then we'll just have these like open discussions. And I've been told that the non-coders and non-technical people really enjoy that post discussion to talk about things at a high level. And I've also been told that even just like sitting through these lectures and watching me build these projects and maybe building things on their own too, it helps bring bridge the gap between the business goals and the engineering side of things. One product manager was telling me that she can finally understand her engineers after taking the course. Catherine asked, to get the most out of the course, would it be helpful to have some foundational experience, maybe do a learning session in a language? Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have some basic idea of Python. I would recommend like one year of experience in programming is helpful because if you're trying to simultaneously like crack programming and how it works and trying to understand AI simultaneously, it might be a lot like a bit of a learning curve. And there are some resources I can recommend for learning Python, like very beginner friendly resources for that. Yeah, deep learning AI. That's a really good one. They got a ton of free courses. They've got a Python course there as well. Okay, so we got a couple of people asking for it. So I've got this like short course here. So I'll share this in the chat. And then if we go down here, there's this mini course on deep learning AI that I think is super helpful. So this one's much longer. It's four hours, but you're excited to get into Python and start writing stuff, I think this is a great place to start. Uh, Daria asks, is it only Python we need? Yeah, so all the code examples are in Python, and that's the industry standard when it comes to AI development.